welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hi everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and welcome to episode 16 for Samhain, the Witch's New Year. For those of us who are Covenant of the Goddess members, Samhain is the start of the new board of officers, both at the local level and at the national level. I took this opportunity to interview Kasha, who is the outgoing national first officer, and she was kind enough to share some of her thoughts with us. This is Lady Bridget, and I'm here with Kasha, the national first officer of Covenant of the Goddess, who is soon to retire that position in 28 days. <laughs> As of November 1st, your replacement takes over, and you've been the first officer for the past two years. Right. And... Um, that's never an easy position. What are your plans for the future now that you're going to be out of the spotlight, so to speak? Uh, well, my personal plans for the first little bit is just to um, rest and disengage a little bit. I think um, November 1st might be the first morning in two years that I haven't needed to check my email before doing anything else. There's a lot of communication responsibilities with the first officer, and I feel like our members deserved when they communicated with us really quick response so I think I might unplug for a little bit but then my focus will remain with my local council um, I still have coven work to do I'm still involved in pagan pride projects so there are plenty of things to keep me busy I have a spouse who I've spent less time with over the past couple of years than I had planned um, so yeah just regroup and focus my energies on local things probably rather than the national picture cool yeah yeah it's it's difficult to go from actually sometimes it's difficult to go from the local to the national and then sometimes there's a little bit of relief when you can step back from from the national and get back down to the local level yeah. where things are a little quieter I'm looking forward to it well and I think I have a, a you know renewed perspective too I have an understanding, a better understanding of how some things work. So that yeah. will help me with my local work. Yeah, very true. And consensus is a very hard thing. And I know, you know, Covenant of the Goddess is one of the very few organizations that runs everything by consensus, mm -hmm. which means that not everybody agrees. There's a lot of communication that has to happen. And there's a lot of tolerance that has to be practiced in order for anything to get accomplished. I don't think a lot of people really understand that sometimes. Right. And, you know, I think at any time along the continuum, we as individuals or we as groups or organizations are better at that or, or not. And mm -hmm. I think it's hardest when there is an emotional subject and people are really invested in their opinion. So sometimes it's hard to hear somebody else's point of view or to be able to step towards their solution and away from ours a little bit, which is what I think you have to do sometimes, you know, in the consensus process. Yeah. And witches are not known for being shy, <laughs> retiring non-opinionated people <laughs> none of the ones i know no no in fact no. i think we end up in this religion because we're not shy and don't want to be disenfranchised don't want to be you know by mainstream religions we don't want to be marginalized and so i think a lot of us end up end up here to be empowered so oh i agree and and I, that's the beauty of the individuals in our organization but sometimes that's the barrier too mm -hmm. um because we're all working towards some greater good, but, you know, we disagree on the path sometimes. And we are adamant about our way sometimes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the new people will be taken over. And um, I think that national service is a growth opportunity for everybody and a great opportunity to serve. And I have taken away all kinds of lessons. So I'm, I am anxious for, you know, someone else to take over the reins to step up mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's great that we retire after like one year or two years and not you know be perennially on the board on the board on the board as i think uh, other than the local council level where it's not that strenuous and it's not that time consuming national board service can like you said you haven't you know spent much time with 
with your spouse over the past two years, and, and I, I know the feeling, have you done some national board service myself, yeah. that um, it can take, you know, 10, 20 hours. It's like having a part-time job it is. that uh, doesn't pay anything. <laughs> right? It's tiring. Plus, I think that if, if we didn't have term limits, then we wouldn't have diversity of perspective. And right. it's so easy to be stuck in a rut about how an organization works and how we've always done it or whatever that I think forcing us to have new officers in those chairs is, is a healthy thing. Yeah, it is. You get new perspective. And mm -hmm. also the person who steps down from the position, as you'll be doing, I'm sure, this next year or so, gets a chance to really um, step back, look at things, um, and take those lessons that you've learned and really kind of analyze it and digest it right. and get a chance to process. Begin to integrate it. Yeah. 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 I know my own experiences on the national board, um, you know, have always left me with mixed emotions. Some, in some ways, very relieved and happy to, to be out of the mix. And then in other ways, kind of like, oh, right. I'm done. <laughs> oh, you know, but yeah. there's always the local council level. <laughs> there is. And there are other years for national for people who, you know, feel like they need to get back to it. So there's always another term somewhere for people. For oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But I want to thank you. Very much for your service. Oh, thank you. During very difficult times sometimes. That's and I think you always showed wisdom and grace and in running the ship, you know, Thanks. setting the course. You know, everybody's not always going to agree. That's what it's like in the world. Right. That's what the world is. Yeah. And and I don't expect everyone to agree with me on anything in any part of my life, so yeah, this is just another extension. Yeah. No, but thank you very much, yeah. and thanks for talking to us today. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Hello, everyone. My name is Equitas, and I'm an astrologer. On today's segment, we're going to be exploring the signs of Scorpio and Sagittarius. We want to remember that while one's sun sign may not be in either of these two signs, some of these attributes may apply to us, particularly if we have house cusps or particular planets in these signs in our chart. Scorpio is a fixed feminine water sign. The traditional ruling planet is Mars, and some uh, modern astrologers use Pluto as an associated ruler, but most astrologers today still use Mars as the ruling planet. Notable about the sign of Scorpio is it has five forms. That's right. There's actually five different archetypes within the sign of Scorpio. And Scorpio being the sign of transformation, it's very fitting that it has so many forms and can take on so many different personas. So the first one is the scorpion. That's kind of obvious, right? The second form of Scorpio is a venomous snake, such as a cobra or a water moccasin. The third form of Scorpio is the eagle, as in the bird of prey. The fourth form is the phoenix, the mystical bird that rises from its own ashes, symbolizing rebirth. And then there is the final form of Scorpio, which is the white dove, because it is opposite the constellation of Taurus, and the Pleiades cluster. So what kind of Scorpio is someone? That all depends on their intentions. The positive attributes of Scorpio are many. They can be very passionate, strong-willed, firm, magnetic, involved in science, have a research-oriented mind. They are driven, penetrating. They like to seep the depth. They like to explore the hidden in the, the occult. They're often very perceptive, they can be psychic, intense. Um, they can also be very charming, powerful, tenacious, and mysterious. On the negative side, Scorpio can be overly secretive, resentful, jealous. They can attempt to be overly controlling. They can be very vengeful. They can even have um, addictions such as drugs or some types of sexual obsessions. They can be sarcastic, deceitful. They can be also a very negative thinker. One of the ways in which the sh sign really shows its Mars rulership is in its strategic, almost military-like thinking. They're very much concerned with the power behind the throne compared to Leos, 
who like to be on the throne themselves, you'll find Scorpios really figuring out where the true power lies. They have a natural tendency to see past the surface and um, superfluous aspects to really get to the depths and the inner workings and knowings about people and situations. In this regard, optimal careers for uh, Scorpios include surgeons, pathologists, military strategists, armed service members, detectives, private eyes, archaeologists, and energy workers, investigators, scientists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts. Next, we have the sign of Sagittarius, which is a male mutable fire sign ruled by Jupiter. Also, Chiron the asteroid is now uh, in modern times associated with this sign. Notable characteristics is it's the only half-human, half-horse depicted in the zodiac. The positive attributes of Sagittarians include um, being optimistic, bountiful, philosophical, friendly, uh, very jovial, very liberal, professional-minded. They're always interested in things of a higher nature, such as learning, scholarly pursuits. Um, they are also very loyal, generous. They try to be inspiring. They're very inquisitive. They seem to have endless energy and potential. They're also very strategic in thinking, like Scorpio. And they're also very much travel-minded. They, they are known to be mentally sharp, uh, very um, global and like macrocosmic in their perspective of things. They're very fiercely independent of their beliefs and thoughts uh, in their mind. On the negative side of Sagittarius, they can often be very reckless and they can be risk takers, especially when just their self is concerned. They can become very over opinionated and very judgmental and very excessive. Uh, sometimes in the negative side, they can be very self indulgent. They can be known for gambling and drinking problems. They can also suffer from something that Virgo suffers from, which is being an overgiver and being very excessive in their help that they lend people, which at some point we all have our limits. And sometimes Sagittarius can overextend their helpfulness and then maybe come even a little resentful when their help is uh, given and given and given and not a lot of at least reciprocation or, or even a thank you is returned. They can also be very um, sharp mouth. They can get very preachy and they can also get into right versus wrong games and become mentally stubborn oftentimes. One thing to know about Sagittarius is actually they're very ultra, ultra sensitive. They actually are pretty thin skinned, even though they don't act like it because they're usually tend to be very happy go lucky, but they can take things very, very personally, even though they don't come across this way. You'll know that you've upset a Sagittarius because they tend to become very mouthy when they get upset. And boy, do they know just how to say the right words to you that will cut you to the bone. On the plus side, Sagittarius are deep truth lovers. They really dislike dogma. They also are more stubborn than a Taurus about a target. When they have a goal that they're committed to, they are willing to lay down their life practically in pursuit of that goal or that higher ideal. Sagittarius absolutely needs to be um, what we call mentally stimulated. They love to exchange ideas and be exposed to uh, deep thinking and high-minded conversation. On the flip side, Sagittariuses really love a good party. So just as they m love hanging out with the philosophy crowd, they also love hanging out with the party crowd too. You need to keep one step ahead of Sagittarius to keep them interested. Ideal professions for Sagittarius include professors, philosophers, conceptualists, questers, explorers, and warriors. Remember, they're one of the only signs of the Zodiac that's actually carrying an armed weapon. 
the higher minded Sagittariuses become what we know know as spiritual warriors. So thanks for tuning in on this segment as we explored these two signs. I just want to note that we've barely begun to even scratch the surface of the depth of these signs. Tune in next time as we cover the sign of Capricorn. And as always, if you're interested in a reading or any other questions that you'd like answers to in astrology, feel free to contact me at paganflorida at gmail.com. Thanks again. Hi, this is Alpandia, and after a brief hiatus, I'm back with another Pandy's Pagan project. As we are approaching Samhain, this project is a simple way to remember those who have passed. It can be a family member, pet, a family friend, or any person who has touched your life who has passed away. We will be decorating candles to serve as remembrances for those important loved ones who are no longer with us. The final outcome will look like novena candles that you can purchase at the store. To do this project, you will need glass jar candles or mason jars. As a reminder, if you use mason jars, you'll also need to get candles. Printouts of pictures of the departed. Printouts of any other words, sayings, or pictures you'd also like to have on the candle. A glue, like Mod Podge. Regular Mod Podge will work fine. You'll just need to decide if you want a matte or shiny finish. Paint brushes or paint sponges, and any accents you'd like to add, such as ribbons, glitter, charms, stickers, etc. For my project, I used mason jars. I picked ones that were pretty smooth on the outside. I'd recommend that whatever you're using have a fairly smooth surface. If your jar has a lot of bumps, your pictures will be bumpy too, which may not be the look you're after. First, clean off the glass to make sure there's no dirt on the outside. Cut out the pictures you've printed out and play with the jar to determine their final placement. Once you've decided where to put the picture, put a layer of glue on the jar, then press your picture into it. Be sure to use firm pressure and remove any bubbles or folds while the glue is still wet. If you have other pictures to put on the candle, you can put them on now too. Let the glue dry for about 15 to 20 minutes. Once it's dry, add a layer or two of your glue on top of it. This would be a great time to add glitter, if you want, to let it shine through on your pictures. An alternative to putting glitter between layers of your glue is to get Extreme Glitter Mod Podge, which has glitter already suspended in the glue. You can also use Sheer Color Mod Podge to achieve a stained glass effect on your candle. After everything is dry to the touch, your candles are ready to go. They can be used on ancestral altars, placed in windows to light the way as the spirits pass by, or during your Samhain remembrances. The great thing about this project is that you can make this candle for any holiday or celebration. So if you wanted to make these for Yule, you would use festive winter imagery. For birthdays, you can decorate candles with pictures of the birthday girl or boy at various ages. Really, the possibilities are endless. Happy crafting!
And that song was Autumn in Asheville by Emerald Rose from their album Archives of Ages to Come. We will be ending the show also with another song by Emerald Rose called Summerland. You can find out more about Emerald Rose and purchase their many albums by visiting their website at www.emeraldrose.com. This is Lady Bridget, and I'm here with Lord Riken as he takes us alphabetically through the medicinal spices in our kitchen. What letters are you doing today? Well, if you look at most spice racks, if you look at most spice list online, there's nothing between G and H. We left off with G last time, garlic and ginger and such, and uh, or I'm sure G and H, G and M, and it's like wrong, foul. There's several things between G and M, and that's what we're going to go through tonight. I can think of a few. Yeah. Well, the first on that list is horseradish. Oh, for Master now, Tonic. For Master Tonic. Now, it might occur to you that, wait a minute, I've never seen a jar of horseradish, i.e. the dried horseradish. You've seen wasabi powder in the stores, but truth to tell, I don't think I've ever seen horseradish powder in the store. However... You can always pick up a small jar of minced horseradish in water. And uh, we off, well, we always have a small jar of minced horseradish in water. And when I'm making Master Tonic, I go out and buy myself a muckin' big fresh root and I chop the heck out of it. But horseradish is just too important. I mean, it used to be used far, 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 far more in cooking than it is now. And that's a shame. And it just proves they've all turned into a bunch of wusses. But... Let's get on with, uh, we're also going to go through uh, lemongrass and lemon peel. So at any rate, horseradish. Well, the first thing you're going to think of when you think of horseradish is uh, breaking up congestion in the, in the sinuses and phlegm and such. The other thing you think of when you talk about horseradish is urinary tract infections of all sorts. It's, uh, horseradish is great for uh, helping to prevent kidney stones it's uh, great for preventing fluid retention. Now, that can mean anything from quick weight loss to helping with the gout to helping with heart disease. It uh, does a great deal to uh, get rid of excess fluid in the body. Uh, horseradish also fights bacteria and uh, streptococcus and such. Horseradish can be used topically as well as internally. Topically, it's used for achy joints. It's also used internally that way, but it's good for sciatic pain. And believe it or not, internally, you can take horseradish and get relief from sciatic pain and gout and colic and intestinal worms. It's incredibly useful stuff. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. If you could get your dog to eat horseradish... You know, puppies often have worms, yeah. and the deworming medicine is kind of pricey. We used to feed the dog garlic, but you could feed him horseradish too? I would tend towards the garlic for uh, worms and animals, but uh, absolutely, you can uh, give, you could, well, I would tend to, say, put it in a capsule or something. Think about it. A, ho a dog's sinuses are like a hundred thousand times more sensitive you probably than couldn't get him to take it right yeah well <laughs> and if he did take it i'd really have a lot of sympathy for that poor dog think about horseradish and do to your nose and imagine what it must be doing to his um, horseradish contains mustard oil which is why you use it topically so many ways but again just like with the mustard plasters of old be careful uh try it on a little bit of your skin see how reactive you are to using it topically okay so I have a question. Mm -hmm. How would you actually use, I mean, how many people these days know even how to apply a mustard plaster? But what you would do is you would uh, pound the horseradish into a pulp, and then you would bind that pulp with a nice bandage or something on the affected joint. So, you, so would you put the horseradish on the bandage or put it right on your skin? I would tend to put an, a, a handkerchief between my skin and the horseradish but it's going to soak through so it really doesn't make that much difference in that sense it's just a matter of neat and tidy as much as anything and then just put an ace bandage or, or cotton cloth cotton or something cloths, over it wrap it over it and uh you know and how long would you leave it on 
somewhere between 20 minutes and an hour, I'd say. I can't imagine there'd be much more effectiveness. I'd just be real careful of it. I've never tried it myself. I'm giving you advice that I have not attempted on my own. Okay. I haven't had a joint that, that was that achy, but mashed up pulp of uh, horseradish applied as a plaster. That's literally the original meaning of the term was you used them as a plaster. You use mustard plasters, horseradish plasters, which again has the mustard oil in it. Mustard oil, which is what horseradish contains, can irritate the mouth, the throat, the nose, the digestive system, and the irritatory tract. That irritation of them stimulates them. So, okay, irritation sounds like it's always a bad thing, and sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not a bad thing. Sometimes it's what you need. You need to stimulate. It's just like uh, your immune system attacking something. The immune system has to get stimulated to attack it. There are uh, mucous mem membranes in all these areas that we just mentioned, the mouth, the throat, the nose, the digestive system, urinary tract. And this, you know, a little bit of stimulation is good. A lot of it could be vomiting, diarrhea. You can find topical applications of mustard oil in the pharmacy. They contain 2% or less of uh, mustard oil. And just raw horseradish contains less than that. So you should be in good shape. But, I mean, if you're out of Bengay and you've got some horseradish... Or Tiger Bomb. Well, if you're out of... That's what I meant. If you're out of yeah, Bengay, Bengay or, or Tiger Bomb. Tiger, yeah. Or Tiger Bomb, which is my go-to. <laughs> yes. Then, which has some of these... Of course, it would be more the wasabi, probably, in Tiger Bomb. But one way or the other... Oh, uh, don't use horseradish if you're pregnant. Not a good idea, apparently. You mean internally? Internally, Yeah. Externally wouldn't make a difference because again it increases urinary flow. Uh, it can interact with uh, certain medications used for lower thyro for low thyroid function. They kept stressing this over and over again when I did some research on this that if you take a med medication, any medication that you take for a condition of low thyroid action, mm -hmm. don't take horseradish. Source after source, I found all said the same thing. Tremendous interaction with it. So uh, probably if someone is on any thyroid medication, they should check with their doctor before they use horseradish internally. Absolutely. Because even though it stresses low thyroid, it might have a similar effect with a, any thyroid medication. They were really specific about that. Yeah. They wanted to use low thyroid. So that's, uh, like you say, horseradish is certainly one of the major ingredients in my master tonic. Mm. And uh, now you can see why. But we're going to move on to lemongrass. The other name of lemongrass is fever grass. Oh, how odd. <laughs> Even its common name in certain parts of the world indicates its medicinal use. Lemongrass taken as a tea. Dried is required in some things. Fresh is preferred in others. But lemongrass taken as a tea helps digestion. It promotes the good bacteria. It treats indigestion. It treats constipation. Heartburn, diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, uh, stomach spasms, cramps, and vomiting. It controls cholesterol. It reduces the absorption of cholesterol from the intestines into the bloodstream. Wow. How about that? I knew about lemongrass, you know, as a, a digestive aid, but I was surprised to see that apparently a glass of uh, lemongrass tea every day can be good for... Uh, keeping your cholesterol down by blocking the cholesterol from getting into the bloodstream in the first place. I guess I'm going to have to add that to my uh, tea regimen. Now, it says that uh, lemongrass helps to oxidize LDL cholesterol, which helps block plaque formation and build up in your arteries. There are certain tests that measure oxidized LDL, which of course is the bad part of the cholesterol, so I'm not sure how that all works together. But at any rate, uh, lemongrass is very high in potassium. So it's good for all those things that uh, good potassium is good for, you know, getting uh, muscle spasms, things like that. Uh, oh, so preventing charley horses? Charley horses and such. And maintaining a good potassium level helps to lower blood pressure. Oh. So, 
So you one might be taking lemongrass tea too. <laughs> I could very well be taking lemongrass tea more often. And the nice thing about lemongrass, mm-hmm. you can grow it in South Florida. Yes, yes. It grows mm-hmm. in the backyard very nicely. Yep, yep. Well, that's, of course, the other practical use of lemongrass is you can buy it right here in South Florida. And I would always plant the lemongrass near a doorway because the mosquitoes and things don't want to come anywhere near it. So one of the ways that I help to keep uh, mosquitoes away from the uh, screen doors leading out to the pool area is I planted lemongrass there. And see, I always use it in making Thai, in Thai cooking. Yeah. I boil it up in the broth mm-hmm. before I make any kind of Thai soup. Yeah. Because the natural lemon flavor is just perfect. The Thai, the thai cooking that you do uses the stem more than the leaf. Uh-huh. You're dicing up the stem and using that, but the leaf's also flavorful. But, uh, I mean, it just makes a great lemonade, as it were. And the thing about this lemonade is that it cleans and detoxes. It's a diuretic. It purifies the kidneys, the bladder, and the pancreas. It eases colds and flu. It's high in vitamin C. It's strongly antibacterial. And it boosts immune system health. Sounds like a winner. Yeah, there's really no downside. I kept looking for the uh, counterindications and problems with it, and... I just wasn't finding any, really, to speak of. Here is a recipe that I found. Oh, good. Boil a few strands of lemongrass with two to three cloves, a piece of cinnamon stick, and a teaspoon of turmeric in a cup of milk, okay? And drink a cup of day for two to three days. That's to uh, get rid of a cold. Now, I don't know about the milk part, but... I'll make this up as a tea and <laughs> just drink it straight. I tend to think that you they probably simmer this stuff up and then add milk, which okay, I can get I can I can get behind that. But the main thing to remember there is that a really good use of lemongrass is to make a tea when you're going to get a cold. We're going to start going into cold and flu season here real soon. Yep. So, lemongrass, high in vitamin C, high in potassium, which you're going to lose if you have a cold or the flu or anything. Great benefits, no no downside. no downside that I was able to find, unless you just don't happen to like lemongrass or you don't happen to like lemonade. I don't know. It's uh, pretty darn good. And lemon peel, well, I didn't find any. Everything that I just said about lemongrass pretty much applies to lemon peel to one extent or another. It's, I mean, we have lemon peel in our spice rack. Well, and uh, yeah. if you need, if you've got to come down with a cold and you got nothing better... Just uh, go ahead and uh, put some of the dried lemon peel in to make your tea. But you know, you can also buy lemongrass powder Mm -hmm. in the Chinese food stores. And I think in the Whole Foods Market type or fresh market type stores. For cooking, yes. Uh, To make a tea out of that, you'd probably need to get one of those muslin bags and put it in it. Yeah. Because otherwise this, I don't know, it'd be kind of like drinking dust. You know, even though it's wet, it would still go down. It would certainly irritate my throat. Uh, I have a somewhat sensitive throat, but uh, it would certainly irritate my throat to try to drink lemongrass in the powdered form. Yeah. Which is the way we have it here for cooking, because you just sprinkle it, you know, in the dried form in a lot of things. But that's different. That's going into a sauce or something. Right. But into a tea... Mm. Probably the fresh grass is better. The fresh grass is better. And you can buy dried lemongrass. I've gone to the Chinese markets, and they'll sell you this huge bag of dried lemongrass for like a buck and a half. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's hardly worthwhile. It wouldn't break my heart if for some reason my lemongrass were to go belly up if I was just looking at it from the standpoint of the leaves. But the thing is, I also want the stems because we use them in the Thai cooking so the lemongrass tea you would mostly make from the leaf part? Yes, you'd make it from the leaf part. I don't see any reason why you couldn't dice up and dry the uh, stems as well, but really it only takes a day or two to dry a lemongrass leaf to the point where it's absolutely perfect to make a tea from. And, of course, you can even put it in there fresh. It's fine, too. But it's funny that you know if you get rid of the moisture, it concentrates the oils, and oh. it also makes it easier to extract the oils. Because the oils before were suspended in water, you got rid of the water, it left the oils behind, you re- reintroduce water, and the oils tend to happily go and join them. That's good to know. Yeah, so that's it. Horseradish and lemongrass are the two things I'm throwing in there tonight. 
And lemongrass is usually available at Home Depot in South Florida. Oh. So you, so you can plant your own. Plant your own if you're down here. Yeah. Be crazy not to. It uh, multiplies. Before long, you'll be splitting it up and giving it to friends. Not if you keep making a tea out of it every day. <laughs> no, no, maybe not. <laughs> then it's a good thing that it grows fast. Yep. Well, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us once again. You're very welcome. In this season of Honoring Our Beloved Dead, Lord Coyote Morningstar shares with us an ancestor prayer and altar setup. Blessings to my beloved and benevolent ancestors. I remember and honor my brother Ben. I remember and honor one ancestor. I remember and honor them all. What is remembered lives. May this cool water be a bridge between the worlds. May this light be a guide and comfort. May this whiskey give you strength. Remember your posterity and family. Continue to guide us and protect us, leading us to health, wealth, and prosperity. May the holy fire that burns in me burn for you to redeem your souls. So mote it be. I introduced ancestor veneration to my spiritual and magical practice in 2006 when my brother was killed. I had just started the Fairy Seer apprenticeship with Orion Foxwood, and we were covering the Divine Ancestor, which is one of the keys of the Tree of Enchantment. During that weekend, I learned how to build an ancestor shrine and knew that I had to learn everything I could about how to honor and commune with my ancestors. My main drive of being that I wanted to keep a bond with my brother and work with him spiritually. I quickly realized, though, that I didn't want to bind his soul to me or to the earth, and I let him go to follow his soul's light. I prayed for his strength and spirit and for his peace. Once a week, every Sunday evening, I light a white candle and put out a glass of water and a glass of whiskey. And every Sunday, I pray for my ancestors and offer my life to redeem them, not as a sacrifice, but as a testament to my love and respect for them in living my life to the fullest, loving, enjoying, and communing with Gaia, I honor those mothers and fathers before me that made me who I am today. In any ritual that I invite the gods and elements, I first invite my blessed and benevolent ancestors. My ancestors have become integral in all my magic workings. I have a soul pot that contains the grave dirt of many of my recent ancestors. That's the centerpiece of my ancestor shrine, and I place the candle on top of it to warm it and to power it. So how do you build an ancestor shrine? Well, first and foremost, you want it to be on the ground or as low to the ground as you can get it. Uh, preferably on the floor, though. Um, lay out a white cloth, a nice clean white cloth, and arrange your candle. Uh, if you have a soul pot, you can use, use your soul pot. Uh, pictures of your dead loved ones, mementos, um, jewelry, little knickknacks, anything that reminds you of your loved ones. Um, you can have, uh, for blood ancestors, as well as uh, spiritual mentors, um, any sort of mentor, teacher, or, or anyone that has affected your life, or maybe you were raised by someone who wasn't your blood family, you know, those would be your family. Those would be your ancestors as well. I like to have Florida water uh, available on my altar. Sprinkle a little bit around. It makes it smell good, and the spirits love the smell of Florida water. Another thing that's important to have on your ancestor's shrine is a cross or a crucifix. Uh, even though I'm not Christian, my ancestors were, and so it's a powerful symbol for them, and it's also a crossroads symbol uh, between life and death, and uh, Christ was himself a living crossroads, being that intermediary between life and death. So also on the, my shrine I have a skull or a figure of uh, Lady Death and um, along with my white candle, a clear glass of whiskey and a clear glass of water. A good way to help connect with your ancestors is to make a family tree and write as many names as you know. 
My mom is a genealogist, so I have a wealth of names. The prayer I started with in the beginning of this talk is severely cut short. Um, the original prayer listed all of my ancestors that I know back to my great-grandparents. And I took it further and listed all the surnames that I had on my tree, which is a lot of names. Then I came across, um, in my research, a variant prayer that states, I remember one ancestor, I remember them all. So in the years that followed, I've shortened that prayer to naming just one ancestor. And sometimes it'll be my brother Ben, and sometimes it'll be somebody else. And then after that, I'll state, uh, I remember one ancestor, I remember them all. So start by writing a list of all of those closest to you who have passed over. And start with your immediate family, your siblings, your parents, your children, then any aunts or uncles, then any grandparents, and then name your great aunts and your great uncles and your great grandparents, and then list all the surnames that you know from your family tree. And if you don't know that many names, or if you don't know any, that's okay. Just say, I remember and honor my blessed and benevolent ancestors, and that'll be good enough. If you don't like your ancestors, well, remember you're inviting your beloved and benevolent ancestors, those that support and uphold you. You don't need to know their names. We have countless ancestors, and they're not all bad people. They're not all assholes. So on that note, I'll close with a quote from the song We Do Not Die by Velvet Hammer. We do not die. We are not gone. We are alive. We are just on the other side. We are not dead. We are alive. We do not die. Blessed be and have a blessed Samhain.
And that was the song We Do Not Die by Velvet Hammer, which can now be found on the album The Best of Pagan Song. You can find out more about Ginger Doss and buy her music on her website at www.gingerdoss.com. That's G-I-N-G-E-R-D-O-S-S dot com. Hi, I'm Cabal, and welcome to Fudu. So for this Samhain podcast, um, I thought I would go over yogurt making. Um, I make my own yogurt, and I'm asked quite a lot of times how it is that it's done. Many people think that the process is mysterious, but it's actually very, very easy to do. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend that you give it a try once. The final product is going to look and taste uh, much different than the products that you buy in the store. And the answer to why it tastes so different is really very simple, is that you decide all the ingredients, including the amount of sugar and additives that will go into it. So you're in control of texture, taste, and everything that goes into that final product. And ultimately, there will be nothing artificial added. It will be a significantly better product than really any store-bought version. And as an ingredient for recipes um, that you might make out of the yogurt, you're really going to notice a difference because your yogurt is really going to be an artisanal creation. So the final product that you use the yogurt in will taste a lot better too. So how you do it is uh, very simple. You need a couple of pieces of equipment, but really nothing specialized. And the first piece of equipment that you need is a glass container that is preferably a Pyrex container. And I'll explain why uh, the Pyrex container is better in a minute. But if you have a container that has a lid, it's even better. And the one that I do recommend is a 7-cup Pyrex container with lid. It costs about $8, and you can find it at most stores like Target or Walmart. The glass is non-porous, and that's particularly important. And the lid is BPA-free. BPA is a compound called uh, bisphenol A, and it's found in many plastic products in the current science as a We probably don't want it um, in our food or in our drinks. The second piece of equipment that we need is nothing more than a food thermometer. But this is a piece that you can't do without. You must have a food thermometer in order to to make yogurt. It is your tool for infection control. So if you don't have one, do not try this. Um, You can't go without it. You can choose a digital or an analog thermometer as long as it gives you temperatures in clear increments. And there's a classic pocket thermometer that's a circular top, and it runs for about 6 bucks. and a simple instant read digital one is about 15 bucks. And again, you can find those just about anywhere. That's really it for the must-haves. And of those two, the thermometer is something you must have. Um, other tools that are going to be useful are going to be a wire whisk and a metal spoon. Um, but one word of caution, your equipment should only be uh, glass or metal, So your whisk really does have to be wire, and your spoon does have to be metal. It should not be made out of wood, and you can't really use any porous materials. The reason is is that such material can harbor bacteria, and no, you don't need a yogurt maker. The yogurt maker can be useful because it allows you to control the temperature for very long periods of time, and some of them do come with alarm settings so that you know when the yogurt is ready. Now, if you choose to purchase a yogurt maker, Check the thrift store first because you can find these for 5 to $10 at many thrift stores occasionally. But again, you don't really need one. All you need is a reasonably warm place like your oven. And in Florida, it's not really going to make that much of a difference uh, because you'll be able to control that high end of the temperature relatively easily. So to get started, 
all that we need to do is to have milk and we need yogurt culture. And the ratio between the two of them is two tablespoons of active yogurt culture to one quart of milk. For the milk, you can choose any kind of milk that you'd like, um, including for cow's milk, fat-free, 1%, 2%, or whole. You can also use nut-based and soy milk. And the steps are identical no matter which kind of milk you choose. The last thing I think I should say about milk is that you can use raw milk. However, raw milk is not only hard to find, it's also highly regulated in terms of its sale. There are a few sources in Florida, and what you'll need to do is find a local farm that has dairy cows and speak with them about whether they are able to sell you any raw milk. It will produce an outstanding product, however it has to be processed very, very carefully. Um, personally, I recommend that you use store-bought whole milk for the first time. It will give you a sense of how great the yogurt product that you make can be, and it will also give you a very good base for experimenting in the future. For the active yogurt cultures, you'll need to find a starter culture. And you can find that in some health stores. Just ask if they have yogurt starter cultures, and they usually keep it in the same section where they keep other dairy products. Or you can go the more simple route of purchasing a store-bought product that is a natural yogurt and reads on the label that it has live active cultures. So if you go to your store and you look in the dairy section, you'll see that uh, some of the yogurts will say live active cultures, and that, those are the ones that you want to use. However, it must be plain yogurt. It must not have any fruit or any other flavoring in it, in it, including vanilla. So just plain, plain yogurt. Okay, so now that we have our yogurt culture and we have our milk, we need to pour the milk into a container and place it over heat until it reaches 160 degrees Fahrenheit and you'll check, you'll check that temperature with your thermometer. If you choose to, you can pour the milk directly into the Pyrex bowl and then heat it in the microwave. It's just a quicker way of doing it. And again, the target temperature is 160. Now I should point out that many recipes suggest raising the temperature even higher to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have any concerns about bacteria in the milk, then you probably do want to raise it, the temperature even higher to 180 or even 200 degrees. But this is a balancing act. What you're doing here is you're sterilizing the milk, but at the same time, the hotter you get the milk, the more you'll break down the natural enzymes and those natural flavors in the milk that will give your final yogurt product the intense flavors that you want over the store brought. I personally use 160 degrees, however, you may want to raise it to 200 degrees depending on your individual situation. The reason for raising the temperature is to get rid of all the kinds of bacteria, anything that's in the milk, that is not what you're going to be introducing. Your, the, the milk will have naturally occurring bacteria in it, and you want all of those dead. You only want the bacteria of interest to you, which in this case is the active yogurt culture, to be what's working on that milk in order to convert it to yogurt, and you want no other bacteria in there. Those bacteria will be killed off at 160 degrees for a few moments, but again, if any survive and you want a certainty for all these bacteria to be dead, then you raise the temperature to 200. Now, once that you've gotten the milk to the temperature that you wanted, at least 160, then you take it off the heat and you let it cool down to 110 degrees. You can, if you have your milk uh, in the bowl or inside of the container that you, that you chose to heat at the pan, you can put that over ice if you want to speed up the process. But the main thing that you must do is cover, the, is cover the milk so that nothing gets in there other than the bacteria that you're going to introduce. So put the lid on or put the cover on and let it sit either at room temperature or over ice until it gets to 110 degrees. Once that your milk gets to 110 degrees, at that point, add your yogurt culture. Again, if you have one quart of milk, you'll want to add two tablespoons of your yogurt. And with the metal whisk, stir that in so that the, the yogurt dissolves completely through it, and then put the cover back on. Okay, so now we're ready to incubate the yogurt. And what we're going to do is put it in a warm place. If you have a yogurt maker, you're going to turn it on and then set it for 8 to 10 hours. Now, if you don't have a yogurt maker, there are some simple things that you can do. 
one thing is if you have an oven take the turn on the oven and let it go to its lowest temperature and then leave the oven door open for a little bit until the oven temperature cools down to about 110 degrees roughly and then put a couple of pans of hot water in there and then you can go ahead and put your culture in there close up the oven and it, should, it will be fine another thing that you can do is to wrap your culture in a towel like a big beach towel and every now and then put some warm water next to it just hot tap water tap water comes out at about 120 degrees and if you put that in with a towel it's going to help maintain that temperature so those two very simple solutions for Florida are actually will actually work pretty well the objective is that you want to keep the temperature at about 105 to 110 degrees for those 10 hours the towel trick will work absolutely perfectly the oven trick will work absolutely perfectly the yogurt maker of course will be kind of a set it and forget it thing after 10 hours your yogurt should be ready and so you'll want to uncover it and with a metal spoon stir it around and see what the thickness is if you want it a little thicker let it sit some more if you want it tangier then you can let it sit some more you can let it go for up to 12 to 14 hours at that point your yogurt is really done it, the longer you let it go it'll be a, a stronger tangier yogurt I like mine at about 10 or 11 hours once that it's ready it goes into the refrigerator and let it cool down at this point let it sit overnight or for at least or at least uh, five or six hours so that it is completely completely cooled the lower temperature will completely stop the fermentation process and your yogurt will um, will be ready to eat okay so now that our yogurt is ready we can make one more decision and that is whether we want to take the yogurt that we have and convert it to Greek yogurt that process is even less mysterious than making yogurt <laughs> what we need to do is to get some of the way out of the yogurt and how we do that is nothing more than strain it Greek yogurt is regular yogurt that has been strained nothing else so one way to do this is to put some cheesecloth in a colander or a sieve and let the yogurt pour over the cheesecloth and let that sit for a half hour to 45 minutes and let all of the whey or as much of the whey as you can um, leak out of the yogurt. The easiest way to do that is just put it in the sink and let the colander sit on top, pour the yogurt in, where the, uh, put the cheesecloth in the colander, pour the yogurt in and just let it sit there. If you don't have any cheesecloth, you can get away with some good paper towels, that particularly good thick paper towels, and you can line a colander with it and then pour the yogurt on top of that. Let that sit over the sink for 30 minutes. And again, if you have a sieve, you can do the you can do that as well. When the yogurt sits for 45 minutes, it will become thicker and thicker, um, reaching the consistency of kind of a frozen ice cream even and when that's ready just put it back in the container and then put it back in the refrigerator and your Greek yogurt is ready to eat okay so the last thing is how sweet do you want your yogurt if you choose to add sugar add it to taste and mix it in with a whisk but let it sit for a while uh, so that the sugar has an opportunity to dissolve a good 45 minutes should give you a sense of that and add it slowly to taste um, at a time so add a minimum amount of sugar and then check it about 45 minutes later to see whether it's as sweet as you want. If you wanted to add a sugar substitute, you can add that as well. And again, what I recommend is that you keep tasting it until it gets to the sweetness level that, you're, that, that you'd like. The yogurt will be delicious just by itself, so you don't really need to add any sweeteners to it. And finally, if you want to mix it with fruit, or you want to add fruit to the yogurt, the fruit should really be heated up first so that you kill off any bacteria before it's introduced into the yogurt so that you have a relatively stable product with no worries of additional bacteria um, coming in from the fruit. And ultimately you'll store it just like store-bought yogurt uh, inside of its container and inside of the refrigerator. And the last thing is that you never want to eat it all. So as you're eating your yogurt, you want to be attentive that you always want to leave two tablespoons of your yogurt for your future one quart of milk 
you can take the yogurt that you've made as long as you've added nothing to it other than sugar or, or a sweetener and you can use that as the base for your future yogurt and over time you develop your own strain and there is a small controversy that's here and that is how often should you renew the yogurt culture and it seems that every five or six generations of yogurt it might be good to introduce some brand new active yogurt culture so that you minimize the chance of any unwanted bacteria taking over your culture. So that is yogurt making. I hope you give it a try. And this is Fudu. Ancestor blessings and happy Samhain. Hi everyone. Before we begin our last segment of this episode, we'd like to thank you for listening. Putting a podcast together is a time-consuming labor of love. But knowing that someone is listening to our hard work and hopefully gaining something from it makes it worthwhile. Would you let us know you like the podcast? By going to our website at emlc.net, click on the podcast tab, and write a comment. Tell us what you like and what you'd like to hear more of on our podcast. And even better, why not leave us a rating on iTunes? Ratings help us become more visible to more people. It's not about ego. It's all about service. Thank you, and blessed be. Hello, my name is Shaylee. Welcome to Nice Witch, a Miss Manor segment for all Wiccans, witches, and pagans alike. Today's topic is accommodations. Gathering together is something I always look forward to. Occasionally, though, I have had to have special accommodations made for me in order for me to join in on the merriment, which is why I have chosen this for my second topic. I have had a few surgeries requiring having meds, one of which also required an ankle cast with severe mobility issues. Making sure I was going to be able to participate has been a big concern more than once. This is why I'm here to say, discuss any special accommodations you may have with your high priest high priestess, event organizers, hosts, or anyone who may have the knowledge and ability to help you out with your special accommodations or inform you if this is an event you may want to consider missing. For this segment, I will call these people your coordinatrixes. It is always hard to be told you shouldn't or might not be able to participate, especially when you want to, but it is always better to know before than it is to spend time, money, and energy on something that you will not be able to participate in. So what kind of things might need special accommodations, you ask? Well, there are, one, physical issues such as if you are injured, have mobility issues, are pregnant, or have physical disabilities. If getting around is going to be a problem, this is something your coordinatrix will need to be aware of before you arrive. This will give them the time to make sure that they will be able to accommodate your needs. Two, vision or hearing problems. Lots of rituals are done at night and or outside. If your coordinatrix knows that you have such issues, they will be able to help guide you or assign someone to do so to make sure you have the best possible experience. 3. Asthma or allergies. Lots of things trigger these two problems, and a lot of us have to deal with these issues daily without needing any real accommodations. Occasionally, though, you will arrive at an event and realize that your triggers are present. Don't be shy and let your coordinatrix know. I am personally allergic to dogs. And most of the time this is not an issue, but if I arrive someplace with an especially hairy or an extremely friendly dog, I will immediately let someone know. This helps me avoid issues like sitting on the dog's favorite couch or appearing sickly when it's just an allergy. Number four, if you are sick. If you are sick, and especially if you are contagious, consider staying home to keep others from catching your illness. But if you feel you must attend an event or ritual, Please let your coordinatrix know so that they can make any necessary accommodations, such as providing your own chalice. Number five, alcohol. If you don't drink alcohol, for whatever reason, as this tends to be what is served as the ale part of the cakes and ale in a lot of rituals, it is something your coordinatrix must know ahead of time. A non-alcoholic alternative is provided occasionally, but not for all rituals, and one should not rely on that possibility. The coordinatrix can make sure one is provided if they know before the ritual begins that this is something you will need. Number six, sensitivity to contact or loud noises. 
Most of us enjoy hugging, kissing, loud chanting, music, and having lots of conversations at the same time. But not everyone does or can. If you have any of these sensitivities, letting your coordinatrix know can make the difference. Number seven, spiritual sensitivities. The last thing anyone wants is to have a bad experience in ritual. And occasionally, especially if you, one is very sensitive, you may need to step back, ground, cover yourself, or do whatever you need to do to feel safe and protected. Letting your coordinatrix know will keep them aware and even help them help you. This list is not intended to list all possible types of accommodations, but to give a general list of some of the more common types of accommodations needed. If you do have or believe you have an accommodation that your coordinatrix should be aware of, don't hesitate to tell them. Better to have someone know than to risk having a problem. Remember, whether we're all gathering to honor the gods, celebrate the seasons, mark the turning of the wheel, perform rituals, simply to enjoy each other's company, or whatever the reason be. We are gathering, and we need to be considerate of each other. So enjoy yourselves, and remember to be a nice witch. They say the road to heaven is straight and narrow. And they say the road to hell is smooth and wide. Well, the path I follow may be long and winding, but it sure when I walk the maze of shadow and the path of light, and I've seen myself in rebel gray and Celtic war, I'll trace the sacred spiral of the mysteries and light to the final turning.
reflections. 